works by maintaining an electrochemical gradient across the membrane and then using um, the dissipation of that gradient in order to power organic synthesis. So some origins of life researchers believe that the initial conditions in which life emerges involve some sort of far from equilibrium system that resembles and could eventually evolve into something similar to what we see today. So where might such a system exist? Um, as you can see on my title slide, what I have pictured here is an alkaline hydrothermal chimney, which is part of the Lost City vent field, which is a um, field of hydrothermal vents that are on the earth today that exist a little ways away from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And these hydrothermal chimneys operate at disequilibrium, and so they've been proposed as sites for the origin of life. So um, how do these work? So imagine we're on some ocean world that has a water rock interface. First we get seawater seeping down into the crust where it can react with minerals such as olivine and dioxide in order to produce an alkaline reducing fluid. And when that gets convected back up into the ocean, it can react with the dissolved cations in the seawater in order to produce a porous precipitate, which is our hydrothermal chimney. And if you notice that this hydrothermal chimney is right at the interface between an alkaline reducing fluid and an oxidizing acidic fluid. So that's been proposed as an energy source for organic synthesis. And there's a lot of work that's been done to map this together, but I won't go into that right now. Um, so the work that I'm going to present today involves trying to create experimental simulants of a hydrothermal chimney in order to investigate their potential as a biogenic system. So here you can see that essentially all we have is an injection of one fluid into another. So that's what we modeled using this apparatus, which is an alkaline fluid, 0.4 molar sodium hydroxide, and a syringe that we injected at a constant rate into a reservoir of mixed ferrous and ferric chloride. And after six hours, you can see, we get a precipitate. Um, so initially we get like a little stub. And the way these things grow is you get this bursting mechanism where pressure from the syringe is coming up into the chimney and it causes it to rupture at the top. And then fluid that's coming up can precipitate out and it bursts and solidifies and bursts and solidifies in order to make a stock. And then if there's any kind of weak spot in the chimney wall, that spot can rupture too and we get branches and eventually we get this thing with a bunch of different branches about three to five centimeters tall. And um, so here I'm showing four different replicates of the exact same experiment. So you can see that the morphology varies a lot but generally we always see something about three to five centimeters tall and um, kind of like green stalks with orange coatings and like two to six-ish stalks each. So um, the main ways that we analyze these are with environmental scanning electron microscopy, <coughs> or PSEM, and also Raman spectroscopy. So our chimney simulants are sensitive to oxygen because iron can come into different redox states. And so we had to be very careful to keep all of our experiments under argon atmosphere in order to try to exclude as much oxygen as possible and try to get them into the ESEM as fast as possible as well. And then um, for Raman spectroscopy, things were a little bit more difficult because it turns out that the Raman beam can melt the minerals within the chimney and oxidize them, forming hematite. So, or I guess just react them into hematite. And so in order to get around that, we had to use the spectrometer at 25% power and also use this thing called a cryostage, which basically just holds the piece of chimney at a really low temperature under nitrogen atmosphere, so that hopefully the energy from the beam goes into heating up the nitrogen molecules instead of, you know, making our minerals turn into hematite. So, 
here is a picture. If you imagine the chimney wall is the stock, there's like a little curved wall on the hollow tube. That's kind of what this is showing. You can see that it has multiple different layers stacked on top of each other. And if you zoom in, you can see that there's kind of a crystalline kind of edgy morphology on all the outer surfaces of each layer and a smoother morphology on the inner surfaces. Um, here's another picture of a bunch of layers. Um, all those little cracks in there are probably just due to the vacuum and the ESM. So I don't think those are actually part of the chimney itself initially. Um, so here again, you can see two layers stacked on top of each other. And on the outer surfaces, they both have this kind of spiny morphology. And then if you look right on the other edge of that top layer, you can see these little blobs called framboids. I think that means raspberries, because they look like little raspberries. <laughs> And um, that's characteristic of systems in disequilibrium. And so as far as the mineralogy of the chimneys, the entire thing is composed of magnetite, pretty much. Magnetite everywhere, but then also iron oxyhydroxides. And there are three different polymorphs of iron oxyhydroxide, um, a cognite, a picrochite, and gurkite. And all of them are composed of this motif here, with the two octahedra attached together, sharing an edge. But those motifs polymerize differently in each one. So we have a cognite with the little rings, the picrope has the little strands, and then your type has like a checkerboard pattern. And it turns out that um, studies have shown that chloride ions can assist the transformation of um, um, iron, ferrous iron, oxyhydroxide, which is a mineral called marine rust, into these ferric oxyhydroxides. Um, and chloride causes cognite to form in lower chloride concentrations, the pitocrocite forms, and then even lower concentrations of chloride and pericrocite forms. So I think that's what's happening in our chimney because we get these concentric rings of the cognite of picrocite um, as we go sorry, towards the interior of a chimney. And um, that makes sense because we're using ferrous and ferric chloride in our reservoir solution. And that, that is potentially affecting the mineralogy within the chimney and causing a compositional gradient to form reflective of the electrochemical. So then, also, we did experiments where we doped our chimneys with organics, which is important because there's been a lot of work done showing that organics can coordinate to fragments within the chimney and then assist in catalysis. So we focus on pyruvate, alanine, and cysteine, because they were interesting. And as you can see, it causes changes in the overall morphology of each chimney simulant. So pyruvate causes this blob to form. Then alanine causes the chimney to make these long stalks. And cysteine causes it to basically just be a gel, which is constantly flowing and pools at the top of the reaction vessel. And what I think is happening here is that organics are kind of wedging themselves into the crystal structure and breaking it up so that the chimney walls become weaker. And um, that makes sense for the pyruvate and cysteine. For the alanine, that I think what could be happening is that since the chimney wall is just so weak because of these, it always is just going to burst at the top instead of becoming strong enough at the top that it has to find and save for the pressure at the side, which is why it doesn't form more branches. Um, so under ESAM, in the pyruvate chimney, we get lots of rounded morphologies and no hint of the crystalline morphology that we saw in our control chimneys. So here are some kind of blurry slides showing that in our control chimney, we see both rounded morphologies and crystalline ones, but in the pyruvate, as hard as I checked, I could not find anything that looked remotely crystalline. 
And then it was a similar deal for the Siskin chimneys. But then for alanine, we found something interesting. We found these rounded morphologies, thanks. And then also another one, which are these spines. So if you see right on the right hand corner, you see kind of blobs, and the rest of this is just cross spines. Here's a zoomed in image of those. So what might be happening here is that alanine is coordinating to minerals within the chimney and stabilizing certain crystal surfaces in order to hinder growth in some directions and cause the needle shape to form instead of whatever was forming earlier. Um, so the main takeaway points that I want to get at with this research is that um, there is large mineral diversity within the chimneys because of these gradients that are established between the inner and outer solutions. And as you can see, there was that compositional gradient in iron oxide hydroxides. So that's beneficial because it provides a lot of different microenvironments, each of which could be tailored to catalyzing a different reaction in an overall <laughs> metabolic pathway. Um, also, the the effect of organics on the chimney is significant because of this theory called ligand accelerated autocatalysis, which basically states that initially early enzymes were just minerals within a chimney, and then as organics come and interact with the minerals and maybe cluster around in an organic motif, they increase the catalytic efficiency of those minerals and raise the potential for further organic synthesis until we build up bigger and bigger polymers. Um, so it gives us a lot more wiggle room in um, synthesis. So I'd like to thank my mentor, Dr. Lori Barge, for <coughs> amazing guidance and inspiration, and being awesome. And then also my lab mates, um, Brian Corbett, a great little pop here, but Flores, Ryan Cameron, and Lee Finian, and Patrick Beckett. And also um, JPL for funding and Oberlin for having me as a student there. Thanks. <laughs>